Good morning, good evening, everybody, wherever you are connecting to us virtually, I welcome you to the dissemination event with interactive content of the report, Travel Transitions, how transport planners and policy makers can respond to shifting mobility trends produced by the ITF working group on urban travel transition in light of COVID-19 and published at the middle of August. My name is Asuka Ito, a policy analyst at the ITF International Transport Forum at the OECD and the facilitator of this working group over the time. I am very, very happy to welcome you all to explain about this exciting report together with all team members and principal authors and contributors that you can see on the screen now. Thank you very much again for joining us today. So this dissemination event will last one hour and a half. We will first have a welcoming remarks and presentation about the overview of the working group by the ITF managers and Secretary General and the presentation about the key findings from the report by the working group chair. Then we will have a moderated session with the principal authors of the report and interactive Q&A session afterwards. So please free, free feel to send your questions by using Q&A function. The chat function will be disabled. I will take your question and ask to the right speaker afterwards during the Q&A session. So now I would like to invite Dr. Yun Tai Kim, Secretary General of the ITF, to, to provide us welcoming remarks. The floor is yours, Yun Tai. Dear, dear participants, uh, I'm very happy to open this session today because the work that we will present to you today falls in the heart of our mission at the ITF, which is to work for transport policies that improve people's lives. I'm also happy because this project has been carried out with a broad range of representatives from our member countries and other stakeholders. It, it truly embodies the way in which we work best by being an interactive and open platform for the discussion of transport policy issues. We do this by working with our 63 member countries to foster a deeper understanding of the role of transport in economic growth, environmental sustainability, and social inclusion and to raise the public profile of transport policy. We are faced with multiple challenges in and outside of the transport sector, congestion, safety, inequity, pollution, and climate change. These are serious challenges and addressing them requires equally serious responses. Responses that address these challenges systematically and with a long-term view. This means implementing coherent evidence-based policies in pursuit of clear objectives. Addressing these challenges will require action on a number of fronts, ensuring access, improving efficiency, fostering inclusivity, spurring innovation, and contributing to a sustainable and low carbon future. And if we have learned anything in the past year and a half, it is the fundamental need to ensure resilience. Addressing these challenges and making effective policy requires a dual understanding of both the past and the future. But it means going beyond simply thinking the future will just be a repeat of the past. What we can see is that travel behavior has evolved in unexpected ways in urbanized areas in the early 21st century. The work describes how the relative stability in travel patterns we have experienced over the past decades has eroded. The COVID-19 pandemic further adds to uncertainty about future travel demand. The churn and uncertainty we now face complicates the task of developing effective policies. One thing that is clear is that forecast-led transport planning is not well equipped to handle this growing uncertainty. Our report presents new approaches which explicitly address uncertainty, are vision-led, and enable the development of resilient plans. It also considers how governance and institutions can be adapted to support such a paradigm shift. The recommendations we are presenting to you today go to the heart of our mission. They serve to improve the way in which public authorities and others can better anticipate the future, 
even when they are uncertain of what it holds. And by doing that, our recommendations help ensure the relevance and resilience of transport policies and thus help improve people's lives. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yuntai, for giving us uh, encouraging, welcoming remarks. So now we, I would like to invite Mr. Steve Perkins, head of research and policy analyst at the ITF, to give us the overview of the ITF working group on urban travel transitions in light of COVID-19. Steve, the floor is yours. Good morning from Paris. And I'd just like to briefly uh, introduce the team that prepared our report on travel transitions and also give, talk about one or two of the things that we wanted to achieve by establishing the group. Um, so the main objectives are to work out how we can better anticipate major changes in travel behavior. That is what we've called travel transitions and to plan more effectively in the face of uncertainty. Uh, we wanted to look at how to spot transitions when they're in the process of unfolding uh, look at how to anticipate transitions over the short and medium term, and then what to do about transitions over the longer term, which are, of course, very difficult, or almost impossible to uh, anticipate, and are very dependent on other changes in society more broadly. And in particular, the group looked at uh, these questions uh, through the experience of COVID-19, um, and particularly how this may have catalyzed some of the trends that were already in progress. So we've been looking at this kind of issues for a long time regularly at the uh, ITF. Um, here's just a, a small snapshot of some of the reports that have been prepared over the last decade or so, starting with a close look at long run trends in car use just over a decade ago when uh, we were looking uh, particularly a lot of people were talking about uh, saturation of car ownership and use and uh, really peak travel in terms of car use. And then through to uh, another look at that uh, issue uh, just last year in the context of planning for zero car growth in the face of climate change and improving uh, the livability of our cities. Now, the background to the new report is, of course, the still unfolding uh, COVID-19 pandemic, which has modified people's behaviors quite, uh, quite strongly, including if and indeed you know, whether they'll travel at all in their usual commuting patterns and other parts of their uh, daily mobility. This is very much superposed on shifts that were discernible since the 1990s from some of these reports uh, that we've published and in national statistics. Um, but under the catalytic influence of the restrictions that governments have imposed to respond to the COVID crisis, these changes may now have broken pre-existing changes, uh, pre-existing trends. And these potential transitions are important to understand and account for in infrastructure planning and provision, uh, in transport and land use planning, and even in the regulation of mobility services as we go forward. So the key issues uh, that the report addresses um, is uh, where, even where we have seen over the last few decades aggregate forecasts of demand that have been reasonably accurate. Um, there have always been quite strong changes underneath countering each other and get a better understanding of what's going on below the service surface was the primary, was the first objective of the, of the group. Um, and then at the national level, there's generally been a focus on projecting future travel demand in order to adapt to it. So very much predict and provide in the general national tradition. Local authorities, on the other hand, have been much more ready to not just wait and adapt, but really seek positively to influence travel behavior. And trying to get that uh, more into the mainstream of transport planning uh, was part of the work uh, of the group as a whole, part of what they were recommending in their findings. Um, and given the doubts about the capabilities for accurate quantitative forecasting of travel demand, uh, there's a growing interest in alternative approaches that explicitly grapple with uncertainty and the group drew conclusions uh, on what were the most promising ways to go about addressing that uncertainty. And then I think their fundamental conclusion was that it's very much a key requirement to develop the capability in our national governments 
for being able to scan for potential shifts in travel behavior and anticipate them a little earlier. Now, the working group uh, included 40 participants from 16 countries and also from the European Union. Um, it was working for our ITF Transport Research Committee of uh, senior researchers across our membership and included uh, external international experts and academics working in the field. Uh, it organized itself around a main meeting uh, in December last year, so very much in the heart of the COVID crisis, and you have a list of the countries on the screen. And then in the engine room, uh, Kiran Chatterjee agreed to chair the group from the University of the West of England uh, in Bristol, uh, supported by Philip Christ uh, from the ITF and Asuka Ito, who uh, introduced the webinar this morning. And with Leila Kalaf, who's providing the support today and fixing uh, problems with screen sharing and so on, and uh, under my overall responsibility. One of the things that the uh, that the oops, just did that back. Well, one of the things that the uh, working group did was to survey uh, this extended membership uh, of officials and academics across the uh, across our membership in terms of where they thought. Uh, that travel demand um, or the appreciation of the changes in travel de demand behavior was in the countries uh, across the membership. And what they found was a very mixed pattern um, with countries quite diverse, UK and Chile, very much in the space of recognizing a need to change the way we go about understanding and planning for travel demand behavior uh, and with some changes in practice already underway. Um, through to Germany, which uh, had a very broad spectrum of views um, from uh, growing awareness to very much uh, we're in business as usual, we don't really need to change anything, and every other country is somewhere in between. So the background is a mixed picture, and what we want to do is pick up some of the most forward-looking uh, practice that's amongst the membership. Uh, and we relied on the members of the group, and particularly the people listed here on this slide, to put together the report that's going to be presented today. So you will hear from um, the members that are highlighted here, from Kieran, from Javier, Glenn, Alexandra, Mehmet, Marcin, uh, Peter, and Greg. And I'll stop here and let them take over and discuss uh, what they found and what they recommend for transport planning. Thank you very much. So we invite the brilliant chair of the working group, uh, Mr. Kiran Shataji, Associate Professor in Travel and Behavior, University of the West, West of England, Bristol, to explain us the key findings from the report. Hello, every, hello everyone. I hope you can um, now see, see my screen. That sharing has, has worked. Yes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes. It's with great pleasure that I can now um, introduce you to the report from the, um, the author's team and give you a, an overview of the findings and recommendations uh, before the rest of the team uh, join me in, in discussing the report further. So let me just first um, tell you a little bit more about what motivated the report, the, the problem statement. Um, we saw there being a crisis of confidence in transport planning. As we have seen past um, forecasts of travel fail to materialize and we are still having current forecasts, which still suggest a, a return to past trends. And there's very much doubts about, about, about that. And there, there's still a reliance on deterministic forecasting method, methods, even as we are increasingly aware of the uncertainty around us, especially through this period of having the, um, the, the pandemic. And this sort of uncertainty, for example, is, it, it, is illustrated today as we wake up it, for example, in the UK, with concern about rising um, prices of gas, pushing our um, gas providing companies into potentially going out of business. It's not in the transport sector, but it just shows how the uncertainty that exists at the current time. Now, traditionally policy and investment in infrastructure has been designed around accommodating the forecast demand even though that path has not been shown to be successful at addressing the, the key challenges that we face, especially um, with climate change. So what we have is transport planning is unquestionably a wicked problem, characterised by incomplete knowledge, a diversity of opinion, 
and values, substantial consequences of what happens in the decisions that are made in transport that go beyond transport to the economy and the wider environment around us. And there being such um, a wide set of interconnections between transport and other sectors, areas in our lives. So we had the um, fortune as um, Stephen introduced the team earlier to have had many experts contribute to this report, including the key thinkers here who have been the lead authors of the four core chapters of the report. And they will be joining me shortly to, to um, talk about the report, their, their chapters and the um, key, key findings from those. And before I turn later in, in a moment to, to recommendations, I will now just let you know the, um, some of the key findings from each of those um, chapters of which the lead authors will elaborate on afterwards. So starting with um, travel transitions, the starting point to, for this report, we found that travel trends in industrialized urbanized countries have confounded expectations with breaks in trends going back longer than we perhaps might have realized back 20 to 30 years even. And it's took a long time for scientific studies to respond to these, these um, breaks in trends to realize they could be significant. And they were only partly able to explain those using the traditional ex explanations of transport and travel trends, the, particularly the economic variables, were only able to go a small way in explaining those trends. We were seeing things like instead, things like generational differences in, um, in, in travel behavior. We also know that the role of transport interventions, changes to the transport system in themselves have been minimal compared to other outside factors in influencing these travel trends. So there's a need to look very widely as to what is um, influencing change. Then we, um, the report goes on to look at um, how we've been looking to the future, to conventional ways we have taken to look, 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 look back, to look ahead. And we found that transport planning anticipates the future predominantly with a predict and provide approach, with the forecasting methods paying little attention to uncertainty. They focus on a narrow probable future, as indicated in the diagram with the central, the central ring showing a small number of probable futures that tend to be explored without contemplating alternative futures around that. And decisions made to deal with this probable, that are then made that, that deal with that probable future, and they end up becoming self-fulfilling prophecies, pushing, uh, pushing us further towards those probable futures and not explore, exploring other options which might lead us to more um, uh, beneficial futures for wider society. So the report then went on to look at how we can handle this level of um, uncertainty about fu the future, travel trends and other developments. And what are the new ways out there to handle this uncertainty that are being used in other fields outside of transport, but also now started to be brought into transport. This um, chapter went further into explaining the nature of uncertainty and to identify that what, we, what we're seeing can be described as deep uncertainty arising from the digital age now interacting with the prevailing motor age and reshaping it. And this deep uncertainty requires a change in how we think about the future, not only a change in the um, tools that we use to explore the future, but a new way of thinking, a willingness to be open-minded open -minded, and appetite to shape that future not only anticipate it. We then finally turned to governance and noted that existing institutional frameworks, whether they are formal frameworks associated with government or informal frameworks uh, associated with professional norms, these can restrict change. Somehow transformative processes are needed even within existing fragmented institutional contexts. And the chapter looks at approaches to achieving that transformative change and referred to case study experiences where that has been attempted, including an example from Sweden where much has been achieved 
to learn how, how that can be enabled. So I now, now turn to look at the um, specific recommendations of the report. So first of all, focusing on the travel transitions that hadn't been anticipated, the first recommendation is to scan for emerging travel trends using a combination of traditional and new data sources. In doing this, we need to pay attention to new outlier behaviours. Be aware that they could possibly be setting trends for the future, which may be adopted by wider sets of the population. We can take advantage of new data sources, but traditional data collection remains crucial to continue to monitor change over the longer term. But alongside those, new data sources, for example, so-called big, big data, can allow more rapid detection and analysis of interesting travel patterns. And I think those have been seen to come to their fore during the pandemic, where we've been able to at least track what's been going on more closely than what might have been the case otherwise. Second recommendation is actually what are those trends that we are tracking? We question what exactly we are monitoring with travel trends and re recommended adjusting this to look at broader measures of mobility that indicate not only how travel is changing, but how it's affecting societal outcomes. And in doing this, we need to look at not only the total of what's going on and the average across populations, but also the um, spread in um, change that's occurring across the population. With our third recommendation, we brings together what we need to do about future trends in terms of anticipating them. We recommend we need to take a proactive approach to anticipating travel transitions by scanning developments, not only as we tend to do inside the transport sector, but also looking outside the transport sector. This needs collaboration with scientists and experts, not only within transport, but with, within other disciplines. We tend to get over fixated by transport developments and exaggerate their likely, likely impacts. Our fourth recommendation is to be explicitly dealing with uncertainty and um, diagnosing what um, uncertainty um, consists of. There are different sources of uncertainty in our forecasts, forecasts that we made relate to the inputs, the relationships in models, fundamental processes which we're trying to model. And as you can see from this diagram here, those sources of uncertainty will tend to overall increase as we have as we look further into, in, into the future. So and we're needing to be aware of the, um, the dynamics of that uncertainty. And also aware that there are diverse st stakeholders at play in looking to the future and in, in, in making decisions, and they may themselves influence those outcomes, those scenarios that we look to project, project into the future. They are subject to influence by the stakeholders themselves. As our fifth recommendation, um, we've already mentioned prediction provider number of times, but our um, strong recommendation is to move towards a decide and provide approach in the face of the deep uncertainty that we're facing. A decide and provide approach is, would be vision led, where a desired future is discussed between stakeholders involving the public, and then a pathway towards that is identified which can negotiate the uncertainty that we will still face ahead. This will seek to ensure resilience in, in policy and investment decisions. And inherent in such an approach is to recognize mobility is usually a means to an end. And it's important to focus on the accessibility that mobility offers in that vision-led transport planning. Our next recommendation is to change the mindset and enhance the skill set of the transport planning workforce to equip the transport planning workforce to, to help towards um, um, this vision led approach to, to our futures work in transport. This um, entails new, no, new notions of norms and analytical robustness, focusing on the plausibility of future outcomes rather than precision. It is better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. Our, 
Our seventh recommendation is to foster a strengthening of international knowledge sharing and cooperation via learning by doing approach. And we hope the, um, this report has set us, um, set, set us on a path towards further international cooperation. The work the, the ITV, ITF does is pivotal in achieving that. Um, confidence in, in new approaches can only be achieved by trying practical examples and, and success with practical examples and sharing those ideas and collaborative, collaborative um, efforts across nations. Then the, finally, the challenging issue of governance. The extent of uncertainty and changed experience can be a stimulus for transforming transport governance. And we hope that this will be the case. We need to develop transformative capacity and that will need to reflect specific context in which, um, in, in which you are working. There is no one size model that fits everywhere. We looked at the Swedish example in the report of a commission led by the Swedish Energy Ag Agency to decarbonize transport. And that showed how the institutional um, fragmentation obstacles can be overcome. So that's my, uh, um, I've gone through the eight recommendations and I'd now like to invite the um, re rest of the lead authors to join me now in um, question and answer session with Asuka to further discuss the um, report recommendations. Thank you very much for a brief and concrete ex explanation about the key findings from the report, Kiran. So for those who joined our webinar later, I see several participants joined a little bit later. So please feel free to send your questions by using Q&A function. The chat function will be disabled during the session. So I will take your question and ask to the right speaker during this Q&A session later this session. So for now, I received one question from the audience, whether the slides will be shared after the webinar or not. We, we are happy to do so. So we will share all slides with all registrants later. So now let's move on to the moderated session by inviting other principal authors as Kieran said. So please come to the floor and put the camera on Javier, Glenn and Greg. So today, I unfortunately, one of the principal author, Carolina Isaksson from Sweden, Sweden is not able to join us, but we have Greg as the representative from the governance chapter team. All right, so I can see now Greg, Javier and Glenn on the panel. Thank you so much. So let's start. So first question towards Kiran. Um, Straightforward. So why do you think public authorities and researchers have been very slow in the past to become aware of travel transitions and understanding them? Thank you, Asuki. Yeah, I think it can be speculated that the delays in, um, in, in instigating studies because those transitions were simply not expected and not believed initially and they were also more widely connected to wider societal changes rather than the transport system and transport professionals are less comfortable and confident to consider the impacts of um or ha they have been less comfortable to consider the impacts um, of events developments taking outside of transport and um that then the um, studies have provided welcome illumination now on those travel transitions including the studies that Stephen mentioned that the itf have been um commissioning but they've not been able to full, fully answer why the transitions have occurred and, and it's perhaps um, an impossible task to it, it's a dead end really to try and um, fully explain those transitions we need to accept that and just to continue to tr do our best but then then continue to be vigilant and to to follow those uh, to track those tra changes and adapt continually adapt um uh, our activities and our thinking in line with those all right thanks a lot so next question towards to the another brilliant author uh, looking back to look ahead a uh, principal author of the chapter uh, mr javier garriza galan uh, transport and mobility director from noman solution and technology so javier uh, the report identifies three different perspectives to transport futures. 
predictive, explorative, and normative. So what has been the most common approach and why is it not enough to cope with transport future challenges? Thanks, uh, Sukan. Welcome, everybody, and good morning from, from Madrid. Uh, thank you for, for joining the, this seminar. Yes, as, as you said, we identified three perspectives to, to um, approximate ourselves to, to tra transport futures, right? Um, the first of all is the predictive way to, to think. Uh, we have already mentioned today uh, how this has been dominating uh, transport studies in the last decades. Uh, the focus there is to, to uh, ask ourselves what will be the future and, and get a, uh, our best accurate uh, uh, prediction about it. Um, other alternative ways are uh, more explorative, uh, where we um, come up with uh, several scenarios to, to see how uh, travel demand may evolve in the future. And the other is a more normative way to approach this, this problem, where we focus on how travel demand patterns should be to accomplish or to be aligned with certain uh, societal goals, right? Um, as I said, uh, the predictive uh, way dominated in the past, uh, this has been uh, a consequence of certain societal demand to, to, to get to know how travel demand is going to evolve, in particular in the context of a large infrastructures that we have to, to fund and so on. So this has been quite important. But as we see in the report and as we will discuss today, there are already some criticism about it, about the limitations of this approach and about how we should complement this perhaps with other, other ways to think, uh, think ahead. Then I have a following question to you. So how well established approach to travel demand forecasting performed in the past? Can you a little bit explain more? Yeah, sure. As Stefan mentioned in the, in the introduction to the, to the seminar, uh, um, at an aggregate level, uh, in most of the cases, there has been a, um, a reasonable uh, level of, of accuracy, right? The, the problem uh, comes when we look at certain processes that are especially uh, critic for, for um, planning our, our transport systems, right? Such as the impact on vulnerable groups or the evolution of new trends, right, or, new, or, or the, the um, adoption of new technologies, for instance, in the transport sector, as we have seen with cell mobility in the, in the past years. So um, although this uh, level of accuracy may have been um, uh, enough or, or useful for certain purposes, um, the, the studies show how uh, we have failed uh, to, to anticipate certain trends that are uh, quite uh, critical for planning our transport system. Mm, thank you very much. So now we invite another excellent author of the chapter, Handling Uncertainty in Assessing Travel Transition, Mr. Glenn Lyons, a Mott McDonald Professor of Future Mobility at the University of the West of England. So Glenn, so how significant is the pandemic when it comes to the report's case for change in the approach to strategic transport planning towards this side and provide? Thanks, Asuka. Um, well, I, I guess to, to address that question, first one needs to look to before the pandemic, um, because as the report very, very clearly sets out, we've been observing uh, changes in travel behaviour, significant trend breaks over a period of probably two decades now. Um, and coincident with that has been the mainstreaming of the digital age, the arrival of internet access and that permeation of internet access across many, many countries globally. Of course, we should be reminded nevertheless that only half the world's population has internet access. Um, looking at World Bank data and also ITF data, it's possible to show across a number of OECD countries as the report uh, reveals that there's now been a decoupling between economic output and road traffic activity, something upon which we'd based much of our transport planning orthodoxy in the past. Uh, so those were very strong signs for many of us before the pandemic. But I think to your question, what the pandemic has really done is placed all of us um, as members of the public, as professionals, and as politicians in a global behavior change experiment um, in which all of us have spent 
in very different ways the last 18 months living in what we've referred to in the report as a triple access system. This is our lives. It's combined of, of digital connectivity um, using the telecommunication system alongside the land use system for spatial proximity and of course the transport system with physical mobility. And what we've seen during the pandemic is how as individuals and societies we've been able to significantly change, adapt our behaviours in the face of new conditions. Uh, and as we heard at the very beginning from Yun Tai, um, demonstrate our resilience um, as societies around the world. So I think it's really the, the self-awareness that we have um, now, particularly as professionals and decision makers, um, that the world really isn't stable. Um, there are significant dynamics uh, and that moving forwards, we really must entertain um, the uncertainty that surrounds us. Of course, alongside the pandemic has been um, increasing awareness and concern regarding the climate crisis, uh, which points us towards, frankly, a global decide and provide. It's no longer enough to predict how much travel there will be and how much related emissions. We've already decided that the future we must move towards um, is one that we prefer, which is zero emissions, net zero emissions. Uh, and so it starts to tilt very significantly the way in which we view transport planning. Well, okay, Professor Glenn, so I have a following question that uh, if you look ahead to 10 years, what does transport planning around the world look like then? Okay, um, well, the first point to, to bear in mind is um, a quote from an ancient Chinese philosopher two and a half thousand years ago. Um, those who have knowledge don't predict, and those who predict don't have knowledge. Uh, so I don't want to give you a prediction in my answer, um, but I will give you two scenarios, I think. One scenario is that um, the very clear niche developments we're now seeing, um, certainly in the UK, and as you heard earlier um, from Steve, in a number of other uh, OECD countries that signal an appetite for decide and provide. Uh, those are indeed niche developments and we must recognize that's against the backdrop of a very strongly established predict and provide orthodoxy um, in international transport planning. Uh, and indeed there are vested interests for many people in preserving that orthodoxy uh, and continuing with it. Uh, and so I, I do see a scenario in future where the niche developments we're feeling now exacerbated or amplified by the, um, by the pandemic start to dissipate. Um, and we, if you like, regress back to continuing with predict and provide um, because mm. the forces of inertia are so strong. However, I think an equally compelling future scenario is that uh, Kieran showed one of the diagrams about future uncertainty that we will see potentially uncertainty we're feeling now persisting into the future or even becoming greater uh, alongside the imperatives of climate change such that it becomes inescapably a, a need for us to follow plan b transport planning rather than plan a of predict and provide and of course plan b is decide and provide where we recognize that we have to be vision led uh, and to accommodate uncertainty and i would just briefly underline lastly the point kira made um, we have to tackle as well the norms around what we perceive robustness to be in our transport planning analysis. Mm. We, we've preoccupied ourselves with producing cost benefit analyses, looking at the next 60 years, and we're confident to give those results to two decimal places. But, but please remember, it's better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. Uh, and so exploring scenarios is about having a different type of confidence uh, in what our analytical can, tools can do to support our decision making. Excellent. Thank you very much for your insights. So now I would like to invite Mr. Greg Marston, so the principal author of the chapter Governance and the Coordination Challenges, a professor of transport governance at the University of Leeds. So Greg, um, in your chapter, you proved an overview of some of the most well-known challenges for, for transport governance in our time of deep uncertainty and climate emergency. 
So one of the things you refer to is the existence of underlying assumptions of links between economic development or prosperity and mobility growth. So which you identify as something that needs to be scrutinized or, and uh, questionized. Uh, can you expand a little bit on why this is so important? Yeah, thanks, Asuka, and hi, everyone. Um, so economic growth is obviously a critical concern for government at all levels, and it will continue uh, to be so. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it's so uh, important to, to bring this more critically into our thinking is that in the last 40, 50 years of the, of the last uh, century, the growth in, in mobility and the motorization of many uh, nations, the globalization of supply chains has been hugely important to the, the change in, in the economy. And so the association between investments in transport and economic growth was really strong and, uh, and important. However, we can't globalize the supply chain twice. We can't um, decentralize our cities and spread out again. Those changes have already happened. And so what we really need to do is to challenge the question that the previous trends are necessarily going to be the ones that explain traffic growth in the future. Because, you know, for example, um, female participation in, in labor markets has massively grown in many countries. Again, that can't happen again. So that was one of the factors that was, was driving traffic growth. So what is going to um, influence um, the way we travel in the future is the question we need to ask. And, and how is that related to how the economy is changing? Uh, and as the various different chapters in the report show, well, obviously, uh, internet access is one of the, the, the major changes and the way in which we're reconfiguring the relationship between physically traveling, um, being locally accessible to things, uh, and having the ability to do some of these things virtually. And clearly, as COVID-19 has shown, the options for doing that are far more expansive than any modeling work before. Uh, had ever shown. And that this is just indicative of the fact that we have to be open to these uncertainties and to the fact that behavior could change in many different ways. And as Glenn was pointing out previously, it's not like we've got any options. We, we, to, to, to just continue with business as usual will be completely non-compliant with our, our Paris obligations. Uh, I mean, your question to Glenn, where will we be in, in 10 years time, I think is a fascinating question. Because if we don't change now in 10 years time, where we'll be is massively beyond any uh, ability to, to come back towards the, the Paris one and a half degrees uh, commitments. We have to make that change now, I think, if we're, if we're going to head in the right direction. Excellent. Thank you so much for your great uh, in insight. So as a chair of the working group, Kiron, I would like to ask you the last question and also your representative from academia. So hearing interesting insight from all uh, principal authors in terms of policy making, I think this is very important to integrate different voices into the process of the policy making, right? So how to link the different voices, including from academia and policy making processes? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. It's, um, and um, I, I respond now knowing that, um, that my colleagues who've just spoken, uh, Javier, um, Glenn and Greg and Carolina, the other lead author, and the other contributors to the chapters have, have all been um, engaging as as experts and researchers. They themselves have been very much engaging with others in 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 their work. So my answer is it's important to have fora where policymakers, experts, researchers, and practitioners come together and can make a, a, a meaningful meaningful difference. And this to happen, this needs to happen at different um, levels, in a nation level, re regions within nations, and in an international level as well. And some examples of um, effective ways of doing that include advisory groups um, of, of governments, um, set, having advisory groups on policy analysis that involve people from outside, that involve um, researchers coming in to, to, to um, identify the cutting state of the art um, developments bring those to the discussion. Um, also joint working, um, 
but for, and that this from both both sides um not not only um agent governments and research agencies commissioning projects um by by researchers uh, but also researchers going out there and inviting uh, policy makers to join them on their projects and this is something that my I know that I've done and my, other, my, my colleagues here have been doing in their research projects. So a two way process of joining, joining up. Um, I just finally like to mention that the, also to involve the public more actively in developing ideas for the future. Um, and a, a promising approach there is involving the public. And I also mean businesses, the business community as well here is deliberative research methods. Uh, de deliberate, deliberative developments of, of not only research but also uh, the policy policy solutions. So engaging with um, members of the public, uh, a sample of members of the public, to um, co-develop um, future options is is, a, is again is again I think a healthy approach towards um, tackling the issues we've been we've been discussing. Great. So now let's move on to the Q&A session with the audience. Uh, I would like to invite the great captain of this huge ship that we are, <laughs> who gave us great directions, Philip Christ, advisor of uh, innovation and focused at the IDF as well. And also I will invite you to put Alex, Peter, Martin and Mehmet uh, camera on, please. So first the question towards to Ms. Alexander, Alexandra Mignon. A senior scientist from Austrian Institute of Technology, and also to Mr. Peter Jaritzma, a senior researcher at Kim Netherlands Institute for Transport Policy Analysis. So Alex and Peter, here we have eight recommendations in the report, which Kieran explained to us in the presentation. Each of you coming from each country's research institute from Austria and also from Netherlands, how then do you believe in implementing these recommendations into your country's local context? Alex? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's great to, to be here and uh, also to share what we have learned as a group um, during um, preparing this, this report. I think that um, here in Austria, this, this um, idea that we have to change something has been existence already uh, a long time and already we were discussing it already 30 years ago when I was uh, studying at university. Uh, but the only uh, issue was how to do that. And I think that the, the report gives, gives uh, very good insights and, and good recommendations how to approach that. Um, and also, uh, also to, to try to change uh, the processes and the methods that we have used so far. Um, there is also there are already a few um, yeah, uh, approaches that we are trying out in, in Austria. And uh, for example, we have um, started the Center for Mobility Change, which is uh, both on the level of local uh, decision makers and local uh, communities is giving advice and uh, also putting more emphasis on the human perspective and uh, the human factors and, and behavior factors and also looking into not the average traveler, but also uh, for example, different uh, behavior groups and what is driving their, their willingness to change, for example, uh, also to make sure uh, if we think uh, about travel transitions, not to leave anybody behind because not everybody is on the same level and not everybody is able to use uh, the, the same um, options, for example. Uh, and this is uh, what we have tried here to install and not only on the, on the local level, but also on the national level. And that's also uh, the reason why I had the opportunity to, to be here, uh, because the, the ministry also supports uh, discussions on this level and also to find out how to do that. Um, and I think it's, it's really important to do it. And I think that plan B uh, has to become plan A, because we don't have that much time anymore. And I think it's, it's uh, unavoidable, more or less, uh, to, to decide and provide. Um, and to use the recommendations that, that we have compiled here in this report uh, and put them forward in, in, a, in as many countries as possible, uh, preferably all of them, um, because uh, the, the only question is if, if we make it uh, happen fast enough, 
uh, but there's no way around, uh, I'm afraid. So I hope that uh, here in Austria, as well as in other countries, we will manage to, to change the perspective and, and put it into practice. Sounds very innovative in your country. Thank you so much. So Peter, we know that Netherlands noted the need for change and change itself rather depending on the business as usual position. Can you a little bit explain to us what's happening in Netherlands in this, in this term? Um, well, uh, what we do at the moment is, uh, what, what, what we did is, um, how could I say that? Uh, in, in a, well, let, let, uh, let's uh, start with, um, we want to convince the main policymakers of the Ministry of Transport that is import it, it, it is important to look, to look in a different way to, the f to future mobility. Well, some, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But tomorrow we uh, already have a meeting with the Director General for Mobility where we present this, the results of this report and uh, try to stimulate a discussion about the uh, implications of the recommendations. So, um, it is important uh, to point out to the policymakers that many mobility driven factors lie outside the transport sector and that behavior changes, behavioral changes and new trends have to be identified in certain segments of the populations and as well in specific geographical areas, even if those trends are still small. Um, for example, in the city of Amsterdam, uh, mobility trends completely differ from certain uh, rural areas where we see an erosion of services uh, due to a shrinking population, for example. And uh, another thing we want to emphasize is that traditional transport indicators like congestion, lost time, traffic jams, uh, etc., focus too much on solving infrastructure bottlenecks. And that's still the, the main uh, uh, thoughts in, in the Netherlands. But if you look at accessibility indicators for different modes, population segments and uh, ge geographical areas, those uh, indicators give more insights in if people are uh, able to reach their destination or activity locations in a certain amount of time. And the use of these accessibility indicators is already gaining some acceptance in, in the Netherlands and have been uh, applied additional to the tr traditional indicators in what the so-called integral, integral mobility analysis, what, what analysis, what we uh, just uh, did and which is the basis for future infrastructure investments. So it is it some kind of awareness to use other indicators than the normal traditional, traditional uh, transport indicators. And the last thing uh, what we do is to convince the policymakers to make more use of scenarios and explicitly include uncertainty in decision making. So building adapt adaptivity and transition pathways into the scenarios, monitor the scenarios indicators from time to time, and then adjust policy. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for giving us your context. So now I would like to invite Mr. Marcin Switala, a Road and Bridge Research Institute from Poland, and also Mr. Mehmet Jadzidi, a transportation engineer at the Ministry of Transport and Inf Infrastructure at Tarki. So we know Poland and Thai, Turkey, we, we have seen a little bit more hesitations towards change. Uh, how would you take these, these recommendations and bring these to the ministry to change toward the future? Could take new actions or how to incentivize these types of recommendations into the real world? So Masin, the floor is yours. Still has them. Um, Problem, technical problem. So, can you just take over, Mehmet? Yeah, of course, Jessica. Thank you very much for this question. Uh, I think where you need to start to change before the implementation uh, is our way of understanding about the future or uh, particularly future travel demand. So, we need to start to change with uh, increasing awareness and deeper understanding about uncertainty in the prediction of future travel demand uh, before taking action into the real life. 
uh, I think it needs to be taken as a first and uh, foremost action in our minds before uh, we do this. Uh, and countries also may need to recognize travel trends, activity preferences of individuals, and need to understand and detect the drivers of change, trend settlers, which is explained in details in this report. So it is about monitoring, explaining uh, travel trends, and scanning for future travel transitions and new mobility behaviors. Another important point I want to emphasize is international knowledge sharing and cooperation. Uh, at this point, I think ITF and uh, not only bridging the gap between academia and industry, uh, but also uh, between countries in terms of uh, expert expertise in transport uh, by providing platform for cooperation and knowledge sharing. Uh, in personal, uh, I hope this report lets planners to rethink the way for uh, transport planners planning and better understand the paradigm shift uh, in transport planning. And uh, lastly, I also hope it will conduce to change in the way of shift from uh, predict and provide approach to decide and provide approach uh, for my country and many. Thank you. All right, thank you. So now we are receiving a lot of uh, questions from the audience. So for example, Mr. Barry from Ireland, I, I guess. So one of the major for failing in most planning is to assume uh, business as, as usual, rather than determine the future we want. So what do you think we should plan or target desired? For example, the climate crisis requires massive reduction in vehicle kilometers and mode shift. Should our scheme be designed with this in mind? Maybe this question towards to back to Kiran. Thanks, Asuka. I, I, I might um, field this around the, around the, the, the team. Um, I think um, in this case, uh, yeah, it'd be good to get a, um, Greg to, could, could I invite you to um, yeah, respond sure. to mm -hmm. that? Yeah, thanks, Barry. I think this is a really um, important question uh, and one that I know authorities are grappling with at the moment. So in, in my um, local uh, city of Leeds, they've um, estimate they'll need more than a 30% reduction in vehicle kilometres. Uh, and at the moment, they still have road schemes on the books, uh, which look um, which look fine underneath the, the national guidance because the national guidance is still predicting a growth in traffic uh, and a growth in, in trips uh, around the city of Leeds. So um, those two futures can't sit together um, very comfortably. So I think this is exactly the, the fault line which Glenn was talking about earlier, which is, you know, we're, we're sat on a, a set of projections from, from previous trends. Uh, and yet we know we need to create a different future. So that's why it's so important that we open mm. up um, these new tools. And as I, I can't remember who it was who said that we, I think it was Kieran, we start to have this um, discussion with the general public because it's such a big change uh, that, that's in, implied by this, that we need to be not just creating new technical tools that give us a different answer, but we need to be using those tools as part of a discussion about, well, how, how should we get there? If this is, if this is the desired future, what's the, what's the pathway that we're going to create together? So I think this can be a very creative process if we're brave enough to go out and use it, but make, make no mistake, I think it is really quite different. Alex, do you want to put as adding points? Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to mention that, uh, for example, in Austria, we, we calculated uh, the, the distance uh, everybody on average would be able to travel with an with a electric vehicle powered by, uh, by uh, um, yeah, um, green energy uh, if the 2050 targets uh, would already be uh, in place today. Uh, and it was uh, three kilometers per day and per day and, and person. So it's it's behavior change must take place. Uh, and I think the the approach that we also um, uh, recommend in the in the report to to think about pathways and not what is happening if I uh, if I uh, realize this and that measure and intervention, but which measures and interventions are needed 
uh, to achieve the target. So turning the, the question around is, is really paramount here. Uh, and that also requires thinking in, in measures that are maybe at the moment unthinkable and also how to achieve this reduction in kilometers and emissions. Uh, and it really takes, um, it, it needs to take also the general public uh, into the discussion because uh, there needs to be a general understanding that this is necessary. Otherwise, uh, it's of course very difficult to realize. Indeed. And Philip, do you add points? Yeah, I'd just like to build on what Greg said because I think that's one of the fundamental things we're facing, especially with some of these more ambitious uh, or necessary uh, changes in behavior, changes in travel and targets that we need to put in place. And that's the asymmetry in objectives. So, uh, we were just talking before with Glenn about how local authorities, regional authorities are often at the coal face. Sorry for the fossil uh, uh, <laughs> allegory here, but um, they're at the coal face of the work that needs to take place. They understand uh, that uh, the types of changes that would be aligned with a low carbon future are going to require significant efforts on their parts. At the same time, there's action taking place uh, at the national level that would work against achieving those objectives. And there needs to be some fora some mechanism uh, put in place, and or if it is in place, to be um, augmented, to bring those uh, objectives in line with each other, to adjust uh, and account for and reduce that misalignment. And I think if you're able to do that, then you're also able to start to think about what then are the actions at the national level that support the kind of behavior change that uh, public authorities at the local and regional level uh, are, if they are acting, uh, will have to deliver on that. Of course, not all public authorities at the local or regional level have um, put in place strong uh, objectives relating to climate change and, and low carbon emissions in the future. And so there's also the case that uh, the types of objectives may be fully aligned, but fully aligned in the wrong way. Um, but where those objectives are misaligned or are apart, then there should be a mechanism to ensure that national authorities are not making decisions that lead against, that work against what local authorities are wanting to deliver uh, on their territory. Kieran? Th thanks. Um, yeah, I'm following Philippe, um, a good example of of where action is being taken um, of that nature is in Wales, in the in the U in the UK. Um, the nation of Wales is um, carrying out a roads review, and this this is um, ar arisen because of a lot of um, proposals um, are long standing. There's a legacy of um, schemes in in roads and in other infra other forms of transport infrastructure that have been planned for for a long time, and they've been planned. Um, based on past expect expectations, which now no longer hold, um, especially with the, the pandemic and um, the, the, the climate change, the the, 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 um, the the accentuating climate crisis we have. A lot of the assumptions and um, for projections that were in place to come up with these um, ideas in the past no longer hold. So the whole basis for the um, expansion of the road network in the country of Wales. Um, has, has it's been appreciated it needs to be looked at uh, and it, it's it, it shows that there's this long legacy of um, ideas that it's um, quite urgent now that we look at it's um, quite can be quite hard to turn around turn transport policy around like a large um, ocean tanker it takes time to to turn things around so there's urgency now not only in coming up with um, new 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 um, visions and solutions, but also in reviewing the ones that are the that are, are, are have been identified previously, and if we're not careful, we'll just proceed. But they're not um, they're not robust now through the um, the changing world that we've experienced. No, no longer applicable. Mm. So Glenn is raising hand. Uh, just yes, to build on that, remind ourselves of the pandemic that we've been living through, um, and imagine translating that across to the world of policy and practice. Um, imagine if we'll ever find um, a politician who's prepared to say, um, I'm now introducing a, a population-wide restriction, a massive restriction on travel, uh, and I expect you to use the triple access system very differently to fulfill your social uh, and work needs. Um, and imagine a world where we said, 
we don't need to do very much analysis because we need to implement that policy tomorrow. So let's just see what happens and monitor it. Um, well, of course, we may have done some analysis behind the scenes in terms of our strategies around the world for coping with COVID. Um, but the reality is we almost flicked a switch on massive behavior change with, lot, with no agonizing for year after year after year about the analytical rigor um, and whether or not we could predict the future. Um, so on the one hand, that gives us some, some insight into the art of the possible, but does remind us how challenging it is, but comes back to that realization that we do have great adaptive capability within our population, as well as, of course, respecting the diversity. And it's that adaptiveness that we now need in, in considerable amounts, as, as Greg has emphasized, in the face of having decided on a vision for the future. It's a very high level vision, which is that we need to decarbonize. But what follows from that is that some, there are some very difficult decisions that have to be made and at a pace that our existing and conventional analysis simply won't allow us to achieve. So we do need to move across to a different philosophical approach to our transport planning, because by being risk averse, in making decisions that are bold, we're actually heightening the risk every month, every year that we allow to move forwards. Okay, so now we have eight minutes left and I wanna take two questions from the audience. So first one is related to motivation for government to change. So Mr. Michael Ruth uh, is asking, how do we encourage transport moderators to change the work that they're comfortable with to a new paradigm in which they do not have much understanding. So this question towards to Mr. Greg. Yeah, thanks, uh, Asuka. Um, I think this is a really important uh, question. It's one we tackle in the chapter on um, governance, where we look at different forms of capacity building. So I think there's a there's a leadership role to be played by governments, which is to uh, set the requirements for the kinds of studies uh, that they want um, doing to to invest in the horizon scanning to do the work opening up the connections to um, the the healthcare system uh, the land use system so that that we're understanding how all of these different trends that we're actually trying to provide the transport system for might be evolving so I think there is a kind of um, a top down leadership role which we call kind of stewarding and unlocking uh, in the report but I think there's also um, um, a learning by by doing that that's necessary and I think at the moment we tend to do the first part of it which is to conduct the studies about the visioning and then not necessarily carry that through into a suite of practice how do we actually do this and I know um, you know, if, uh, Glenn's been working with the Scottish government, for example, on on thinking about a new way of looking at its strategic um, project portfolio. We have to build that experience, and there is a lot of inertia in the consult in the world of consultancy. We've trained all these people to work in in one way, and we have to retrain people. We shouldn't underestimate that. But I know from again from work that that Glenn's done with young professionals in in the industry. We're not, they're not necessarily happy with the way, the way things are at the moment. So actually they would be responsive to, to having a new opportunity to build a different kind of future with our transport systems. Uh, learning by doing and also providing new opportunity for younger staff is indeed is essential, I guess. And Philip is raising hand. Yeah, I just want to, to talk a little bit about what we are saying planners and public authorities should do. Uh, and what they have been doing. And I think if you were to encapsulate what they have been doing is mainly trend discovery. You know, our foresight work is trying to understand well, what's going to happen in the future and, and try to create some certainty, if you will, in the, in the planning provision of what the future is. Um, but building on what we've just heard, uh, both in the general discussion of the report findings and what Greg has just said, and maybe uh, going to what Kat and Luis have asked in, in the uh, discussion Q&A about, um, what methodology should we apply? I just like to hit on the fact that maybe we need to be spending a lot more time mining the churn, not discovering the trend, but looking at the disaggregate changes that we can observe right now, either in an experimental phase, like what Greg was just talking about, or just even uh, without 
classified formal experiments taking place. Because it's in the churn, in the change in behavior where um, some parts of the population are adopting new behaviors while other parts of the population are dropping out of uh, old behaviors uh, or entering into what were considered old behaviors that we find a lot of value in terms of looking for outliers. And I think going back to what Kieran said at the beginning, uh, that is really one of the ways in which we can make our work more robust to this uncertainty uh, is to try to identify those outliers and, and then understand um, at what point if they will become more central behaviors uh, going forward. So I think moving from trend discovery to churn mining, a very quick commentary though on what it is we should target. Because if you read this report, uh, you'll see that we, we question, and I think rightly so, um, expecting that the future is going to be a continuation of the past. But the future is really unevenly spread through our membership and through the world. And so there are many countries where um, the future does include better road infrastructure, for example, and better rail infrastructure, simply because they have not yet been developed. And I think uh, the guidance that we're providing here isn't uh, saying that these things shouldn't happen, but that they should happen in a more considered way that accounts for the specific kind of uncertainty that we're facing now. So it may very well be that countries do need to extend their road networks, but they have to do this keeping in mind that um, fossil fuel uh, resources may not be available as they were in the past, and that the kind of uh, patterns of development that uh, that kind of infrastructure has, uh, has supported in other countries may not be tenable in their case. And so they have to reassess you know, what does this infrastructure service and how does it service the population? Uh, so just to make that point, we're not against thinking about extending future inf infrastructure. We just need to think about making sure that we account for this uncertainty when countries are looking at this. Great, so following, uh, so uh, Mr. Luis Miguel is asking another angle that the pandemic showed how work related trips could change. So working room form just one or two days per week it may contribute to diminish both pollution and accidents. Uh, Alex, could you be part of this solution from Austria? Uh, yes, to, to a certain extent, but maybe not the extent that we are expecting because uh, um, our Austrian uh, environmental agency, they did a study actually during the, the COVID uh, 19 pandemic and looking into the, the behavior changes and how teleworking is, is also influencing traveling. And what they, they saw there is that, uh, yes, in, in travel related, in, in work related trips, uh, there was a decrease, uh, but there was an increase in, in leisure uh, trips, for example. And there were a lot of people who they were giving up their annual passes for public transport because they said, uh, I don't have to pay for an annual pass if, if I'm only working at the office for two days a week or so. Uh, and so they were also changing their, their behavior more, more using their private cars. So um, I think that we, we also should uh, understand the, the travel uh, behavior changes in a more in integrated way and also look into the changes uh, they are causing on another level mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to also see how much is the contribution of a specific behavior change and uh, aren't there any rebound effects that, uh, that are then counter, uh, counteracting uh, the, the goals that we want to achieve. So yes, it can be um, a, a contribution, but we need to be careful. Greg, so can you just add your example from the UK on this topic? Yeah, so um, in a longitudinal panel study, we, we have um, 56% of people uh, had work from home at least some of the time. So we mustn't forget those people who, who've never worked from, from home. Um, of those, if people continue to work from home half of the time that they, they had been during the peak of the pandemic, then we'd get a 17% reduction in, in uh, vehicle uh, kilometres. Um, I, mean, I would agree with what Alexandra said, you get actually a, an even bigger reduction in, in rail miles travelled, so that there are some other downsides. Um, the commute is only 20% of all uh, miles travelled, so you know we're looking at 4 or 5% kind of uh, reductions, so that's important. Um, we, you know, we need solutions from, from across the board. Um, you know, I think for me, what it does do is it underlines the importance of understanding 
the, the wider system that we're interacting with. That's only possible if businesses and individuals change and we understand the relationship between them. There have been other changes, things like how we provide healthcare, much more uh, remote provision or remote screening and so on. These are the things that we need to be connecting into as a, a, as a transport profession. Those things are also on the move. So we've, it has potential, but I think actually the lesson is uh, for us to reach out much more into all these other aspects of how we live our lives and understand how, how they're on the move. So Stephen Perkins, Head of Research and Policy Analysis at the ITO, please raise your hands. And... Yes, thank you. And just it illustrates uh, the point that um, Alexandra made, that people's, if people's commuting patterns are changing to three days a week instead of five, governments need or and uh, and and uh, industry needs to react very quickly to that if it isn't to create a counterproductive trend of people relying more on their cars. And the UK government's uh, intervention to get the rail companies to offer shorter uh, commuting passes um, in the UK has been, I think, a very positive response to that problem. And now you can buy a, a three-day-a-week or a two-day-a-week uh, travel pass instead of being obliged to spend a lot of money on an annual pass that for, the, for every day of the week, which you simply can't justify if you're teleworking half the time, or you don't really don't know what's going to happen over the next year. So it illustrates you know, how this kind of work that the group's been doing can be put into policy implementation immediately. And it's not just a very long-term issue. Thank you very much. So we addressed, I think, all the questions that we received in some way. So now I turn to Philip to provide a summary comments to end this session. Yes, uh, thank you, Asuka. And the first thing I'd like to say is again to thank all of the authors and contributors to this project and those that contributed uh, just by providing comments and review to the work itself. Uh, it's a very good example of what uh, uh, Young Tay said at the outset um, was one of the roles for the ITF to serve as this platform for knowledge and to provide that as a resource to our member countries and other public officials and stakeholders. Now, uh, when we entered into this work, we were working with a number of governments that had an expectation that the future would be, as we've heard, a linear extrapolation of the past. And, and this was probably, well, it definitely was a flawed, but certainly a somewhat workable uh, solution given this unusual and atypical period of stability that we saw in travel demand um, patterns going from the late 19th or 1950s onwards up until the turn of, of the century. Uh, what we know now, uh, as has been said repeatedly, is that uh, was a moment in time and that uh, the kinds of projections that we made based on that are working uh, less and less. That doesn't mean they're not helpful, but we have to think more broadly about how we address this. But more fundamentally to this issue of moving from a predict and provide stance to a decide and provide stance. I think, uh, and here this is commentary on the report itself. In fact, by predicting and providing, we were making a decision and that decision was that the future will be like the past and that we need to accommodate this as an exogenous factor. In fact, we were deciding and making it so that the future would be exactly like the past because part of that prediction came to be self-fulfilling. So we have always been deciding and providing. What this report hopefully helps to understand is that we have greater agency and possibilities to change those decisions and to be much more transparent and explicit about the kind of future that we want and to orchestrate our policies to deliver on that uh, rather than thinking that this is something out in the ether that we simply have to accommodate. And so with that in mind, I really encourage you to uh, download this report um, and to at least look at the executive summary and ensure that uh, this is something that is aligned and becomes aligned with the kind of work that you may be doing, of course, in the public sector, um, but in the private sector as well. And finally, I'd like to finally uh, thank our uh, intrepid uh, my super colleague, Asuka Ito, for moderating this session. Uh, she was the stalwart of the project. It would not have happened without her. Thank you, Asuka, for all of your contributions to this work, as well to the rest of the team. And also, Leila, thank you so much for helping us as the background of this uh, webinar. Do you want somebody to say last words? So, Kieran? Uh, thank, thanks, Asuka, mm -hmm. Philippe, and uh, yes, thank, thanks, and Stephen. Uh, thank, it's been great to, for, to have the opportunity. Uh, I think I can say on behalf of um, all of the um, 
the the authors and con contributors to to this report and the, the other people that we engaged in the event we held in December. Um, and we're just um, really really keen now to to um, to see, um, see the, the you know response to the, to to the report and to ourselves being actively engaged in facilitating um, action action on this. So I'm delighted to hear uh, from P Peter um, that um, tomorrow you have this meeting in, in the Netherlands with with the Directorate General there. Um, and I hope, that, I hope that's a stim, stim, stimulus for, uh, for the rest of us to um, do, have similar engagement. Thank you. So we have 10 minutes to end. If you have any words from Guren, Javier, Mehmet, Peter, Alex, Greg, if not, we can, oh, okay, Guren, <laughs> please go ahead. Um, yes, I, I would just uh, coming back to the earlier question um, about modelling, but also um, anticipating the future. I think in relation to modelling, uh, it's not about suggesting that our modelling capability is now uh, redundant, but actually repurposing that modelling capability. Um, we've been talking a great deal in, in debates around modelling about the importance of explorative analysis. This is looking at what if scenarios. Um, the challenge there is how we can run more scenarios in our modelling, maybe with less detail, rather than the argument we often hear now, which is we don't have the modelling resource and the run times to consider too many scenarios. So please narrow um, your scope of the future. Uh, but I think also to remember that it, the report emphasises that on the one hand, um, we really have new capabilities to monitor trend and trend changes. Um, but as we've acknowledged, that will never take us far enough because going into the medium to longer term, it's almost beyond our reach. And this is where scenario analysis um, becomes so important that we do allow ourselves, both with quantitative and qualitative modelling, to explore those what ifs um, and entertain very different futures. Indeed, as Kieran showed near the beginning, the futures cone, where we go from probable futures to possible futures, um, in fact, there's an extension of the cone uh, I now understand that reaches out to preposterous futures um, where we really have to almost think the unthinkable um, if we're serious uh, about shaping the future in a way that provides society with a, with a fulfilling um, and resilient future. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, Alex? Yeah, um, I, I can just add, up, add to, to what... Uh, what has been said now, and uh, we are also trying to, uh, in a couple of projects, trying to approach uh, um, in, in a way that we define a, a transition corridor uh, to a desired future and define also the, the indicator values on this pathway. And this can help us also to, uh, to do our forecasting and scenario building within such a pathway. And this can be a way uh, to make sure also that we uh, look into the direction that we want to to go actually and not to to lose ourselves uh, somewhere on a pathway that we don't actually want to go uh, and as, yeah those projects uh, they will of course be shared and also the approaches that that we uh, try out in there also a very integrated approach uh, taking into account different societal goals for example not just transport or, or directly transport related but also um, indirect effects that need to be taken into account um, and I think we really should uh, start it now uh, and not lose any time and also um, not wait for us and the projects to what, what we achieve in there, but also on a, on a broader scale uh, to learn from each other and go such ways um, and to, to try out how to, to define such pathways, helping also others to, to follow them as soon as possible, because uh, really time is running out and, and we don't have that much time to wait for results. So we need to start it and then by doing that. Very good. So once again, thank you everybody for joining us today as a panelist and also participants. A very great discussion, I guess. So we will shape the future, brilliant future together. So look forward to working and also seeing you all in, in near future. Sorry. Thank you. Bye. Bye.